Hello and welcome to More Than The Score. I'm Tony Moclair and uh, this is Isolation TV. Joining me, my co-host on this here AFL VFL themed vodcast is the great man, the walking sports almanac, Troy Zanta. <laughs> G'day, Troy. Oh, you're too kind, Tony Moclair. Great to be here, mate. And episode eight. We're nearly there. We're nearly double digits. I like it a lot. Uh, that's... Uh, this is the Lance Whitnell of episodes, and I'm, I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> Two thumbs up for big, for big Lance Whitnell. I love that's, it. That's right. There'll be, <laughs> there'll be no celebratory pig's heads thrown around. That won't happen on more than the score. No, I tell you that. No but, way. Uh, as we approach double digits, I tell you what, I've lashed out and gone and got me a haircut. That's what I I've done. I tell you what, mate, you are looking very spiffy indeed. I tell you what, very sharp. Thank you. Well, you'd almost argue, Troy, that uh, I needed to look this good because yeah. I'm going to face the tribunal. Always <laughs> loved the idea of the hulking fashion brutes. tribunal. <laughs> exactly. Hulking brutes putting on the bag of fruit to yeah. go and see the AFL VFL tribunal <laughs> in the hope that a good set of duds, maybe, maybe from Peter Jackson, <laughs> <laughs> might convince the tribunal to knock a week or two off the punishment. Oh. And you've read it beautifully. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about uh, on today's episode, Troy. Uh, tribunal appearances and their shattering impacts. Yes, we are, Tone. And uh, I tell you what, I've devised a, um, a top 10 of tribunal appearances for you. Outstanding. Uh, some absolute, some of the biggest names ever to play the game. Uh, now, it is... I, I love the theatre. I, I used to, I mean, it, it's not like it used to be, but I remember watching them as a kid, <laughs> being, uh, being led in, the glare of the, uh, the flashlight from the cameras, um, the sometimes faked contrition during the statement <laughs> afterwards. The fake contrition, yes. <laughs> the, uh, I, I also, and I don't know if this existed, and I, uh, maybe this is a discussion for another time, Troy, but the honour code that existed... Yes. ..that you wouldn't yeah. lag out uh, the bloke who hit you. Now, is that still a thing? Well, not so much these days, uh, Tone. It was, was absolutely in place during pretty much the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and probably up to the 90s. Yeah. But, yep. but now with all the TV cameras, all the different angles, you can be reported after the event. That's obviously point. Through, through video evidence. Yeah, but there, there was a code that you didn't you didn't lag the guy that uh, <laughs> that belted you no. back in the day. Exactly, that uh, that caused you an injury requiring uh, craniofacial surgery. <laughs> that's what, that's what, pretty much it. Yeah, and, and and thus ending your career. What what a great code of silence that was. Anyway, Troy, you've uh, you've put together this list, and it's. I'm going to go out on a limb here and describe it as something of a rogues gallery. It is a rogues gallery. Now, you're all over rogues galleries and you've been involved in many rogues galleries over your radio and your TV career. <laughs> so maybe there's, a, there's another episode, uh, TV and radio, and we'll devise a, a top 10 of rogues for that one. Well, good luck narrowing that down, but I'm, I'm, I'm very keen to hear some of the names on this list. I know they'll all be familiar. Um, and you would, I mean, I, I'm confused as to why the AFL Tribunal doesn't have certain reserved seats. It should have about 30 years ago because there, were, there was a revolving door. Um, and certainly looking at, uh, well, as you know, I'm Carlton obsessed. So David Reese jones I know, would be the clubhouse leader for... Uh, tribunal appearances, but I'm very keen to hear this list as I know everybody else is, Troy. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Tone. David Reese jones he, he appeared before the uh, tribunal 25 times, but he, he was only suspended. That's an incredible number, isn't it? 25 <laughs> times, but he was only suspended for a total of 22 games. Well, so over a playing career at two clubs going, there would have been a dozen years at least in, in the great man's career. I'm, I'm not sure how many, but... Um, oh, over, over a dozen, Tone. But he, yeah, so that's the ratio there is less, less than one. An that's appearance. not bad. 
I'm, That's very impressive. Well, I'm I'm always f- fond of telling people, Troy, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> you gotta love YouTube. You gotta love the the dedicated make- fans who put stuff together. There was a mo- <laughs> there was a montage of David Reese Jones clocking guys, and. <laughs> In full view of the umpire who is standing not a metre and a half away. So, Reese, who I've met a couple of times, and he's a, just a superb... Yeah, he's a great guy, man. isn't he, to talk to? Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, but anyway, on the field of combat, he, he'd clock a guy and then in front of the umpire and then get reported. And as he got reported, he'd... Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. He, hey. he could not believe the injustice. <laughs> Confected outrage. <laughs> yeah. And there's a so, montage of that online. But that, but it's funny you say that, Tony, because most of these guys, a, a, as you said, once they, they dish out the punishment, they put their hands up and say, mate, mate, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Reese, was, uh, he's right up there. Now, another one of our favourites, uh, the man, the five-time night, five-time day premiership player, the man who wore the earrings, the Golden Locks, the famous number 23 for Hawthorne. 39 games for Dermot Brereton. 39 games suspended. Wow. Hey, I was thinking uh, before we recorded this, what punishment did Mark Yates get for the 1989 hit? And uh, secondary follow-on question, who hit Dermy and did they get pinged as well? Oh, sorry, who what? hit Dipper? Who hit Dipper? Well... Gary Ablett ran into Dipper. Ah. Yeah. It, uh, he, he ran into him. At, from recollection, it was the, the member's wing of the MCG. Yep. And Dipper, yeah, actually, I think he had a, a punctured lung. Yep. He sustained from that. And the Gary Ablett running at full pelt, uh, when you're not seeing him, is going to cause a lot of carnage. So that was the most probably... One of the most violent grand finals we've uh, we've ever seen that 1989 grand final, but it had everything. It was just uh, you know six point margin at the end in, yeah. in favour of the Hawks. Ablett kicking the nine goals, the the Brerett and Yates incident uh, was just an amazing. I was actually lucky enough to be there, Tone, and it was just an amazing atmosphere, just incredible wow. pressure well, cooker stuff. You might be interested in a fantastic Melbourne-based author named Tony Wilson. He's written a book yes. about it. It is available now, and uh, he's spoken to all of the combatants in, uh, involved. But just uh, just to, to backtrack, did Yates get pinged at the tribunal for that hit? Does that, does that ring a bell at all, Troy? It doesn't, but subsequently, uh, there was a lot of pent-up rage because Dermy had gone... Uh, are looking for a, a lot of the Geelong plays in a previous game. Yeah. So that that yep. Mark Yates, that was an even, that was to even up, but it was also to put out, you know, one of the vital cogs of that Hawthorne machine. Yeah. Yeah. And as as we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, to Dermy's credit, he got up and he made an impact on that game. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of animosity there between Mark, uh, Mark Yates and Dermot Brereton. Well, for sure. <clears throat> It, it didn't last. I'm, I've told this story a thousand times, but uh, I was in a Triple M when I was working there on the 20th anniversary of that. And the producer took a message. Um, stop me if I've told this one before. But the producer took a message, walked into Dermy, handed him a piece of paper. Dermy read it, threw his head back and laughed. And the producer yeah. came out and I said, what was that? And he said, that was Mark Yates calling. And I said, what was the message? And he said, happy anniversary. Happy so anniversary. That's a hundred percent true. I was there. I saw it. So there was wow. no lasting animosity between them. I think they, they understood that what happened on the field stayed on the field. But um, although Dermy's surgeon wouldn't say that if uh, if you'd no. seen the results and, and he's not alone there. So, all right, we've got David Reese jones Dermot Brereton, two uh, yep. giants of 80s and 90s football. Who else, Troy? Another giant of 80s and 90s football. One of my favourite players. Uh, unfortunately, he played with, with Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> the year was 1997, time. Yeah. The Blues were playing the Bombers at the MCG. Yep. And Diesel was having an amazing tussle with one Sean Denham, yep. serial niggler for the Essendon Football Club. And uh, Diesel got pinged for nine weeks for pushing uh, umpire Ian Coates, one of the most uh, 
just unbelievable decisions ever handed out by the tribunal. Seriously. You know, it was just over the top. There was a... I mean, the South African government, we know were bad, and they even put a microphone in Nelson Mandela's cell. And when that decision yes. was handed down yes. about, about uh, the great diesel, Nelson Mandela was heard to say, crikey, and I thought I had it bad. <laughs> so Nelson was up in arms about he diesel was, topping the nine weeks. He was oh. furious. Well, Gee, he was. Was it Robin it Island? Was it that he was that yeah. um, he was incarcerated on? Yeah, Prison yeah. Island. Prison he got Island. all the way back. For uh, and ju- just on Diesel, he um, over his career, he racked up thirty-four games suspended. So and still managed to win two Brownlow medals and a Norm Smith medal. If you don't mind, that's yeah. pretty good. Was he? I I don't remember him being particularly. Uh, short tempered. I, mean, I know he could get fiery, and after a day of being niggled by denim, you certainly would be. Yeah, that's um, for and, sure. And if you've seen the incident, there's virtually nothing to it. He simply, all Diesel does is he's fixated on, on denim, and he kind of just gently brushes the umpire to one side. Um, you, you would remember, too, the legal twists and turns that followed yes. that suspension, too, Troy. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just an unsavoury time. Uh, in the AFL at, at that stage. Obviously, Diesel, his career had, had come to an end, you know, in, in 97. And, it, you know, it just was, it wasn't a, a great way to go out for such a fantastic player. So, no, you're right. And it really was. I mean, you know, a standard day at the office for him was 44 touches. And uh, the other injustice that he will tell oh, you yeah. too oh. is getting those 44 and not getting a vote. And um, subsequently, not getting the third Brownlow. Am I right in saying that? Well, well, it cost him the third, the third Brownlow. Tony, yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. Yeah. Well, that's uh, there's, geez, there's certainly a link here between uh, playing ability and appearances at the tribunal. I'm looking forward to the fourth name on your list, Troy. Well, I'm going to keep that up with super talented players who are very fiery and. Everybody remembers fabulous Phil Carmen. Uh, now, amazing. I'm going to take you back to Moorabbin Tone. It was 1980, the Bombers versus the Saints. And the Saints actually won that in a nail-biter by three points. So there was, there was a lot of tension. It was a very close game. And as we all know, Phil Carmen head-butted boundary um, uh, umpire Graham Carberry as well as striking Gary Sidebottom, the result was a 20-week all-up suspension. Yep. And that, uh, that's been replayed over and over again. I wonder now, because, I mean, look, as, as we know as fans, there seems to be something a little ad hoc about um, penalties handed down by the tribunal. They're, they're trying to put round pegs in square holes, if you like. Yeah. Um, do you think, Troy, that for those two offences, you would get 20 weeks today? Or would you get more? Or would you get less? Yeah, it's a great question, Tone. Uh, the thing was that, and, and I've actually interviewed Phil Carmen on radio, and he just said that Carberry invaded his personal space and he was so close to him. Right. Obviously, you know, regrets the headbutt, but the, the incident was, was provoked by... Phil Carmen uh, belting Gary Sidebottom. Right, yep. And, and Carberry's come in from a long way off and, and reported Phil Carmen for yeah. when, when he, there's no way that he could have actually seen it. So, uh, okay. It was just a, one of those join the dots type scenarios where pressure built and it, it, it you know, one of the most famous incidents in league history. Well, it's been a tight game. You can imagine how amped up it was, how how heightened everything was. Um, and uh, just to, to get back to that point, I, mean, I guess these days there'd be a massive financial fine imposed on top of the 20 weeks. And and um, and then that magic cure-all, there'd be some counselling. Yes, the counselling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, in, in, in inverted commas. Yeah. That's right. So uh, and capital letters. Let's say. <laughs> that's right. But well, the fa- sorry, okay, Tony. Go, Troy. 
There was another famous incident with Phil Carmen, and most Collingwood supporters would say till this day it cost Collingwood the 1977 Premiership. Yep. In a semi-final, he was reported for striking uh, Michael Tuck, the, Haw- the Hawks champ, and he re- the result was a two-week suspension. So the interesting part about all that, 1977, he, he misses the drawn grand final and he misses the replay. Wow. Oh so if he had been given the one, he gets yep. another chance in the replay. Yep. And obviously most Collingwood supporters will say, unbiased of course, that yep. Phil, Phil Carmen, he, he, was the, he was the difference. And the, the season that he had, more than likely... It could have happened. Having seen the incident, Troy, do you think it was a, a fair penalty? Uh, the two weeks for Michael for Tuck? Do you, do you think... Oh, look, back in that era, probably not. I've seen it quite a few times. May have given him one. Yep. But, but I think two. Obviously, they gave him two for him to miss, the, obviously, the grand final and the first game of the following season, but it was calamitous that it was a drawn grand final and a replay. So it really rubbed it in for, for the Collingwood supporters and, and Phil Carmen. So yeah, that, it's, that was. It, it's, it's such a big ethical debate, isn't it? For, for those handing down the punishment, because you are essentially tearing the heart out of a player. Um, and, you know, and we know that I guess the soul of justice is discretion. And, yes. Um, yep. Uh, to impose that can can sometimes look cruel, but I, I, you would also argue, and the tribunal would, that previous form um, goes into sentencing to it a, does. a great degree. It absolutely does, and and it did back then too, Tone. I think if if you had if you had priors, yeah, I think that they looked on that very dimly when they were sentencing you for the next. Uh, Next appearance. Now, Michael Tuck has an angelic image, but oh, you think so? If you speak to, if you speak to the odd person that he was capable of niggle. Oh, uh, Tucky. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that wiry frame. Yeah. Yeah, and got around for you know well over four hundred games, and they exactly. just a bit of justice out. Don't worry about that. Exactly. Tucky. There, there may have been a little bit of provocation there. I don't know. I'm just alleging that. But uh, uh, look, that is that is a hard thing for for him to bear, um, yeah. Carmen. That is. But for the rest of us, look, anything that prevents Collingwood from getting a premiership is, to me, <laughs> good. <laughs> Spoken like a true blue bagger. Spoken like a true blue bagger. Just on that tone, missing out on grand finals. Another. Well, it's it's a sad story, but this guy was absolutely brutal in the uh, in the justice that he handed out over his career. Big Carl, we know him oh, as Big Carl, Carl, Carl Dittrich, Jeez. and he missed St, St Kilda's only premiership, only inverted commas capital letters in 1966. Yeah, uh, due to a six match suspension, he incurred a six match suspension. In the penultimate round uh, of the season for striking Fitzroy's Daryl Peoples. And obviously the Saints went on to win that by a solitary point with Barry Breen kicking that, that legendary point. But uh, yeah, Big Carl, uh, a superstar for the Saints and missed out on their only premiership. So uh, yeah, some, some tears to cry there for Saints supporters. They're the big superstar from East Brighton missing out on their, well, their first. And I won't say only because hopefully they'll win a, f- a few more. Yes. If... And hopefully, they'll, um, <laughs> hopefully somebody from the PR department will remember to <laughs> insist that the boys are wearing St Kilda jumpers. Yeah. <laughs> You'd wonder how many people, you talk, you know, in the whole COVID thing about a tsunami of hospital patients. Um, The same would apply to to, uh, anyone who tried to gently needle Big Carl about the fact that he missed out on a grand final. You you were taking your life into your hands there, I'm sure. Has he spoken about that um, at at great length? And if so, I mean, was there any insight into... Big Carl become somewhat of a recluse 
after his career. Okay. Uh, I had an interesting career, Tony. Obviously, started his career at St Kilda. Then he went to Melbourne. Yep. Then he went back to St Kilda. And then he finished his career at Melbourne. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So he, uh, he spent, spent a few years there coaching them. And they were in the doldrums back then. But uh, in Carl's last game, uh, it was against Collingwood. And just let's say, with nothing to lose yeah. and not, never playing the game again at that level, yeah. Carl, Carl's uh, arms and uh, fingers, let's yeah. say they were involuntary for most of the game. <laughs> he had no control over them. Uh, I'm sure that – I hope that spasming has died down now. <laughs> Most help. entertaining. I'll I tell you what, the, the Saints had some real firebrands, and here's a name that will ring true with all football supporters through the 70s and 80s. Robbie Muir. Had well, the nickname Mad Dog Muir. And uh, he was involved in a incident uh, against the Blues, believe it or not, at Moorabbin. Yep. Uh, it was in front of the famous – the infamous, I should say, the animal enclosure yep. at, uh, at Moorabbin. And he clocked blue. Do you remember a guy, Dennis Collins? He wore the number one Guernsey and he had a heavy beard. God, no, that's a bit obscure for me. Yeah, well, uh, after being reported for striking another uh, former blue, Val Perovic. Oh, yeah, yeah, St Kilda player, yeah. Yeah, and, and Robbie Muir actually in a later game in 1984, was suspended for 12 weeks for striking Val Perovic at Princess Park. Wow, so, so not even Val's moustache was able to cushion the <laughs> no, blow. No, not against Robbie. Jeez, okay. Um, and then, so what, is that, does he hold the record for the most weeks suspended for a single act? No, the... Look, there were two guys back in the 1900s who were suspended for 99 games. Oh, my God. For taking bribes. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, um, they they hold the record. But, obviously, uh, Dermy on 39 games. He yep. um, And I think Robbie Muir, only 22 games. So, he was up 13 times for 22 games. That's actually not bad. Again, you know, maybe the dog wasn't as mad as we thought, but... Uh, no, oh, <laughs> most wingmen that played in that era, those, uh, those jutting eyeballs, Marty Feldman type eyeballs, they oh, yeah. were terrifying to most, most wingmen back in the 70s and 80s. No, no, I, no argument there. Okay, who else on your list, Troy, of most suspended players in the, uh, the five minutes or so we've got left? Well, I've got, I'll just run through them. I've got Jimmy Cracker, who uh, was suspended for 25 games, the North Melbourne champ. Yeah. Uh, Rotten Ronnie Andrews, who was one of the, the greats for, for the Bombers back in the 70s and 80s for 24. And Tony Lockett, 23 games, Tony, the great man, plugger. Do you remember the famous incident, 1994, the Swans yeah. versus the Crows at the SCG? And it was a collision with... Adelaide backman, Peter Caven. Ah, oh, he wasn't ex-Carlton, was he? I'm thinking, no, no anyway, sorry. Um, okay, so how many weeks did he get for that? Hang on, 96, the Swans were up and about Not, in 96. Yeah, 94. Oh, 94, was sorry, ni- Yeah, 94, eight weeks. Eight weeks for that. He See, Plugger, who um, we were lucky enough to see play, he, he was magnificent. And oh, he, of, he was the epitome of the, the awkward uh, tribunal attendee. The suit was. never looked right on him. He always, you could tell he was always annoyed at being there and not um, oh. with the pups. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He lo- lo- loves his Greyhounds plugger and boy from Ballarat. And yeah, wasn't a big fan of donning the bag of fruit and heading <laughs> into... Uh, to VFL House and stating his case. No, he wasn't a fan of that at all. Just ask Eddie Maguire with the uh, the javelin crutch thrown at him uh, when Eddie was trying to get a story out of Plugger one night. And what was that? He threw a, dra- a javelin at, uh, at Eddie's well, crutch. He was on crutches. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. And he, and he just uh, went, went the javelin. Yeah. It, uh, and uh, missed Eddie by 
a bee's diaphragm. And, uh, right. Well, so. five minutes with, with Eddie would make you do that, so I can kind of understand where he's coming from. Uh. <laughs> so that was the tale of Plugger. We could talk about Plugger all day. What a, what a fantastic player he was. I loved watching him play. Just, right. It was a delight to watch. It, you know... Um, Agile in a marking contest, maybe not, but just the run-up, the dead-eye dick, the, uh, uh, the follow-through. He, there was just something really, I don't know what the word is. He was very hard to hate, the thing. Yeah, like that. yeah. as an opposition supporter, I love watching him play at St Kilda. And when he went up to Sydney, he was just fantastic. He was mesmerising. That's the word yeah, that, yeah. that I would the- use. And, the, the, you know, a bit like uh, Buddy going decades later, the move to Sydney seemed like a very good idea and it did pay dividends for, for Plugger, didn't it? A lot, a lot of parallels with that move, Tone, yeah. with, with Plugger and Buddy. Yeah. Uh, just, just quickly, uh, players who miss grand finals due to suspension. Oh, this is, this is a I've, tragic list. What have you got for us, Troy? Well, I've, got, I've got two blues, actually. Yes. Fraser Murphy in 86 and Bernie Evans in 87. Wow. Okay. So, Bernie missed out on that, that uh, 80, famous 87 flag. Uh, I think you've brought up Neville Crow before. Neville Crow missed the yes. 67 grand final. He yes. uh, missed that premiership for, for the Tigers. Uh, Crackers Keenan missed the 1978 grand final for the Roos, which, of, which they were beaten by Hawthorne. Uh, big Steve O'Dwyer, Straub's O'Dwyer from Melbourne, had the red hair, number one. Yep. He missed that 1988 drubbing uh, by the Hawks. And one of the most famous in history was John Coleman in 1951. Tell us about this one, please, Troy. Well, he copped four weeks for striking Carlton's Harry Casper. Yep. Uh, and as most Essendon supporters would say at the time, that that, that cost him, you know, the premiership. Uh, Coleman just in, in the peak of his career. But the thing was with Casper, that Casper provoked him throughout the game. Yep. And, you know, just kept niggling and punching him. And obviously the umpires caught Coleman retaliating. And a lot of the times the retaliator cops the suspension. And the bloke, that, the, bloke the niggler, the, the provocateur, you know, gets off scot-free. And, and that's what was claimed. That's what happened that day. And there's a very famous photo of John Coleman coming out of the tribunal in tears. Yeah, I know that. After, yep. After that was handed, that suspension was handed down. Well, you would. And um, there was one that you mentioned in there that, that involved uh, Big Nick. And the, the bloke he hit who got suspended was apparently nowhere near the fist of Big Nick. Actually, no, sorry. Big Nick staged. It was one of the first staging incidents. Uh, it was Carlton player and uh, staged yep. and and uh, unfortunately, the player went down and missed the grand final. So, um, it, I mean, I was saying earlier, Troy, we love the tragedy. We love the emotional highs and lows. And Jonathan Coleman, or, John, you know, Coleman, I should say, coming out of the tribunal crying, that kind of sums it up. You, and you, you, yeah, like we were saying before, you've got to weigh that justice very heavily. But uh, by the same token... If I was a Melbourne player who missed the 1988 Grand Final, I would lo- write a letter of thanks every year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Straubs will say that. Yeah, he, he probably wasn't too unhappy to not be part of that uh, absolute smashing. But that's that's an iconic photo, Tone. That uh, photo of John Coleman coming out of the tribunal, and we, we spoke about iconic photos uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that's you know that's in your top five of all time. That one. It really is. And just uh, as a side note, Coleman, I think, remains the most collectible VFL player. Anything to do with him is the most sought bit of memorabilia in the AFL. There's something about that bloke. Yeah, it, it's, all, it's, um, he's, it's like a mysticism Yeah, about yeah, John right Coleman. And, uh, and the thing was, you know, tragically died at the age of 44. Wow. Yeah. So um, it, it, it's a, it, for such a, a wonderful life, it, it was a tragic end. Uh, a superstar as a player, he was a premiership coach as well. You know, 
his average, his goal average was incredible. Uh, you know, young boy from Hastings coming down to the Bombers in 1949, 12 goals on the boot. Yeah, it's yeah, it's just it's incredible. And as you said, uh, it's interesting. And obviously, Rick Milne would uh, he'd be all over that. The, uh, the John correct. Coleman collectibles. Yes, yes, he's a Fitzroy supporter, by the way, Rick Milne, who. Uh, was writing in the uh, the AFL guide or the the uh, you know footy record, but uh, he appears on my overnight show on three AW doing antiques and collectibles. Is a football man through and through, and uh, is is a great man to contact if you want to get set straight on AFL collectibles. There's a lot of well, let's say dodgy stuff out there, but you need uh, yeah you, you need somebody to set you straight. He is uh, he's your man, Troy. Magnificent work. Magnificent. It's been a pleasure, Tone. Always great, mate, to do podcasts with you. And I've got to say, really enjoying the the 3AW segment, uh, the sporting segment that we do together. I am loving that too. If you want to hear Troy, you can hear him on Australia Overnight every Friday morning. And just quickly remind us, we did nicknames, animal-based nicknames, on the show on uh, Friday morning, and we got an hour's talk back out of it, thanks to you, Troy. It was magnificent. Thanks, mate. We had a little bit of fun, and I think uh, for this week's show, if uh, if the, the people that are watching the podcast now, if they want to want to tune in, the subject matter is going to be football's fashion factory. I'm not even going to ask about that because I want to hear that explored on Australia overnight. It's three <laughs> after the after Friday morning. <laughs> You're a great man, Troy. Thank you good, for that. Good on you, Tone. In, uh, more than the score, that's the football almanac brain of Troy Zantuck in high gear today. I'm Tony Moclair, and we'll do it all again in a week's time here on Isolation TV.